everyone, Anarch here. This is another installment in Anarch Abridged, and uh, this video and the last few videos have been me going over a reading list that I wrote up. Uh, you know, I created this reading list because people asked for it numerous times, and uh, being me, of course, I had to make it way too long and encompassing various topics within anarchism. So uh, this, this time, uh, I'm going to be finishing the list that I started at the end of the last one over black anarchism. Uh, I'll be uh, noting a few more picks from that. And then I will be moving into the topic of decolonization, anti-imperialism, and uh, anti-globalization. So uh, the first ones that were on the list in the Black Anarchism section, I just want to, you know, kind of uh, uh, bring up what those were again so that, you know, if you didn't watch the last video, you can just at least have an idea. And uh, the first one is a talk by uh, Ashanti Alston uh, called Black Anarchism. Uh, the second one is the video by Andrewism, or you might know him as St. Andrew, called What is Black Anarchism? And uh, the last one that I got to on the list was a really great way for us to, you know, uh, uh, end the previous video. And that was Anarchism and the Black Revolution by Lorenzo Camboa Irvin. So uh, the next one on the list is called uh, Childhood and the Psychological Dimension of Revolution, again, by Ashanti Alston. So I should note, this one's just an essay, which, you know, several of the videos that are on this list, or rather, sorry, sev several of the texts that are on this list are purposely essays. Uh, this one, I think, is actually really great because it also uh, is... is um, one of the only presences of youth liberation literature that's on the list, but it does it from a very interesting framework. And uh, as the title suggests, Childhood and the Psychological Dimension of Revolution, it's about essentially uh, what it is to be a child and to form a mask so that you can fit in with society, so that you can function in society. And that that is a, a sociological process that we go through. And it talks about how that process is both unhealthy for us as children and it leads to long-term unhealthy effects upon our psyche as we grow older and talks about how in order for us to be good revolutionaries, we actually are going to have to do some work in changing our psychological predisposition and, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to peel back some of that mask that has been programmed into us so that we can fit into a very unjust, oppressive society. And uh, I actually cited it in, I believe, the first video in the series. Uh, but I am not entirely certain. I'm pretty sure that's where it was cited. But I really found it very insightful. There's a lot of beautiful quotes in, in this, uh, this short essay. Uh, and uh, yeah, I highly recommend you read it. The very last one that's on the list is uh, A Soldier's Story by Kuasi Balagoon. So um, it's kind of hard to summarize what a soldier story is, uh, but uh, Kuasi Balagoon is one of the earliest black anarchists. And um, he, he wrote uh, poetry. He, some of his uh, uh, speeches that were given on the stand in the courtroom are in this. Uh, several people sort of retrospectives of their experiences with Kuasi and uh, who he was to them. Uh, that's all that's all contained here. So we've also got some of the writings of Kuasi Balagoon in this piece. It is a very significant piece for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that it's like one of these sort of uh, uh, staples of black anarchism. There are a lot of people that they're, uh, th that this book was very influential in their growth as an anarchist. And I've met numerous black anarchists for which this book was very important to them, but also several anarchists for which this was like their foray into black anarchism. And I think that uh, it, it, I can see why. So the mixture of different kinds of things, different kinds of materials in it, you know, poetry and these court speeches and people talking about Kawasi, it's all extremely compelling. Uh, Kawasi was larger than life. I think he, that's one of the reasons he was such an influential figure. And uh, he was a black anarchist so early that they didn't even really 
call him an anarchist very early on. Uh, they were calling him a maroon, which is a, a, a ref, you know, you can look for, for onto uh, Andrewism's channel to find out more about the maroons in that piece I mentioned last time uh, that he wrote, you know, what is black anarchism or, you know, it's been named a couple things. But uh, it, uh, he was a, a Black Panther, like several of the people that are on this list. And uh, he is one of a number of people that have been called like Panther anarchists for that reason. So he was a Black Panther, and then he moved more and more towards uh, uh, anarchism as he was noting that the um, Black Panther Party's you know authoritarian line had failed them. But even before that had taken place, he was much more anarchistic than a lot of people that were surrounding him. Uh, and another thing, I mean, just something else to mention is that. Uh, he was also queer in a time when that was very challenging to do, not just in, you know, black communities, but in community, uh, you know, society at large. It was a very brave thing for him to be openly queer. And he also like very closely allied himself to, you know, anti or like, you know, uh, anti, I guess you could say anti-AIDS activism, but, you know, activism around the, the issue of AIDS. Uh, he was he was a, a self-avowed nationalist. And this is part of the reason why that in the black an anarchism trend, you'll find some discussion of, of nationalism and sort of like attempts to clarify what nationalism is and how it could possibly be, I suppose you might say, a horizontal nationalism. And uh, he, he was a, a committed, nonetheless, he was a committed internationalist. And he very much believed in working with broad coalitions of people. Uh, just a very inspiring figure. You know, you, you just find yourself kind of uh, uh, falling in love with who he was as a person, I feel like, as you read through Soldier Story. Uh, both both very militant and a very just sort of like kind and exuberant person. Very, very interesting uh, character. So that's a Soldier Story by uh, Kwasi Balagoon. So now we're going to get into the part of the list where I noted what I thought were some key materials on the topic of decolonization, anti-imperialism, or I guess you might say anti-globalization in one or two of these. So um, several of these are not explicitly anarchist. And uh, that's because I actually think some of the best pieces that have been written on these topics are not really by anarchists, but these are uh, pieces which are adjacent to anarchism, or these are tendencies which, which tend to be uh, adjacent to anarchism. Uh, it, that is to say, we have some, you know, presence of uh, the Zapatistas, um, but we also have Fanon and, and Césaire. So uh, I think what you'll find is that to a significant degree, decolonial literature is more anti-authoritarian on average. And uh, for that reason, you'll find that a lot of anarchists are very open to reading people who are not explicitly anarchists or even um, necessarily avowed anti-authoritarians because decol decolonial literature really kind of has more of a tendency to be that way. So um, I won't really comment on why I think that's the case. That's, I suppose, the topic for another video. But I just wanted to note that as we proceeded through, these are the, these are the first ones, I suppose, so far that have not really been just explicitly anarchist materials. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, the first one is the Sixth Declaration of Selva Lacandona by the EZLN. Um, but... Uh, even though I chose the sixth, I also want to note that like the fifth was also very, very interesting. Uh, these are, um, I suppose you'd say, public declarations of the intentions of the Zapatistas at key points in their history of struggle. And the reason why I'm is, is suggesting the sixth is because it's the most recent. It's the, it was just released very recently, only just a few years ago. Uh, and the reason I'm uh, suggesting the fifth is because I think it'll give you a lot of context for where they've been recently and what has led them to the point that they are at now. So uh, the fifth and sixth declarations are, are very inspiring. They're very beautiful. And I think you'll get it may seem odd that this is how I would introduce you to the EZLN, but 
these statements really are very good encapsulations of the ideology of the Zapatistas, how it relate, or Neo-Zapatismo is what they call it, uh, how it relates to indigenous Mayan uh, uh, cultural conceptions and how it relates to libertarian socialism writ large. Uh, and uh, it's not only authored by, it's often uh, given credit uh, by Subcomandante Marcos, but uh, it is not just written by Subcomandante Marcos. It's actually a collaborative effort from what I understand. So these declarations really, they give the line of the, Zapatism, the Zapatistas and their understanding of the world. And I think what you'll find is this is not only a really good, it, I agree broadly with their critique and their problems and their, and their understanding of the world, but I think this will also give you like a, a much better understanding of the context of uh, indigenous peoples in Mexico. I think it will give you, uh, a, a, it might give you a better understanding of just sort of like an indigenous understanding of the world uh, at, in that context. But I think one thing I really like about it is that the Zapatistas ha always have this very sort of hopeful approach to things. There is this, there's this, there's this focus upon, upon dignity that is, I think, not lacking elsewhere, but I think that it features very strongly that they are they are asserting their autonomy and dignity within these pieces. Um, and these the the fifth declaration, more than the sixth, but also the sixth, uh, contains significant commentary on the forces of globalization and how they have interacted with Mexico. And uh, obviously, those were not positive. And uh, I think you can see the, the commentary about the effect of globalization on Mexico, not only like broadly on Mexico, but on the, the rural portions of Mexico within these pieces. Uh, and I think that makes them very valuable, but they're also just broadly very good philosophical pieces. They're just very interesting to analyze and they have very astute political analysis, which I think for a lot of people is going to be very fresh uh, uh, from coming from either the anarchist or the Marxist perspective, because they're really not narrowly either of those, but the Zapatistas are very anti-authoritarian and they are only becoming more anti-authoritarian over time. So I highly recommend the sixth, but the fifth too, if you like, if you end up liking the sixth. So, uh, the net next is Wretched of the Earth by Fanon. Uh, I didn't include black skin, white masks, but I think that if you end up liking Wretched of the Earth, you should probably read Black Skin, White Masks. Also, um, a really wonderful piece, uh, very insightful. I think it will help people understand how colonialism functions quite a bit better, uh, how it interacts with race, how race is used by, by empires and by colonial powers in order to colonize the populations that they want to exploit. Uh, but Wretched of the Earth is an exceptional analysis of, of colonialism to the degree where it is kind of like one of the key texts of, of decolonial literature. And uh, there's good reason for that. Fanon's analysis b ranges between so many different kinds of approaches. You know, yes, he takes this, you know, sort of like psychological approach at times, uh, looking at the way the psychology of people's people are chained is changed in the process of colonialism. But it also has very good political and economic analysis. Um, it contains, you know, critiques of the rise of a national bourgeois in colonial projects. It talks about, you know, how, you know, even, even if a colonial project is good, even if a national liberation project is good, it, it offers critiques of the, the pitfalls that can take place in the, um, in the process after you have thrown out your colonial oppressors. Uh, it, it really also, I guess another thing I would mention is it's quite beautiful. It's quite beautiful. Uh, it, it, it's written with a, with a very sort of, uh, um, uh, sympathetic or, you know, it's like, it's like equally scathing yet empathic in its prose. It's sort of like both beautiful and brutal. And I think that there's a great deal of value in, the, in this text not, uh, for, for all of these reasons, right? There's a reason why it has stood up so strongly over time. Even pieces of Wretched of the Earth by themselves are read in reading groups, for example, on violence. So highly recommend it if you're trying to understand uh, colonialism in a broader sense. 
Uh, and the next one on the list is, uh, I would say kind of holds a lot of that in common, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of focused in a different way. And that is discourse on colonialism by, I think this is said, Ame Cesare, uh, you know, probably screwed it up, but, uh, you know, discourse on colonialism, unlike wretched of the earth is not, is, is spending less of its time analyzing how colonialism works and spends more of its time addressing the arguments against colonial or a for colonialism by European society. Um, uh, but not only by we, European society, I suppose more broadly by Western society. And uh, I think that it is going to, it, it has discussion of how colonialism functions. Uh, but I think that uh, for a lot of people, those are going to be some of the most important parts of it is probably kind of like debunking some of these conceptions that you still might hold that are pretty backwards that you maybe you didn't even realize that you you were thinking about it in the wrong way. And that as you proceed through hearing these arguments that he's addressing, you may find yourself accidentally uh, uh, characterized in this process and not not have even thought about some of the biases that you had held uh, uh, from this sort of Western justification for colonialism. And I think that it's very valuable just in that sense. It's also not terribly long. Uh, it's not, it's not a short essay, but it's not as long as, uh, uh, many of the pieces here. So, uh, the next one on the list is Monster of the 21st Century by Kotoko Shusui. And this one has also been mentioned in previous videos. It is, uh, one of the only ones, or, uh, it's one of the ones that is written by an anarchist, but when it was written, Shusui was not an anarchist. <laughs> uh, but you can tell why, like, that the foundations for an anarchist critique were present. He, uh, he, he's, he's not, he's like anti-authoritarian, but it's, he's not all the way there yet in this piece. Nonetheless, even though this was before his transition to anarchism, he still it still contains very good insight into the nature of imperialism and how it functions. And it should be said that, um, you know, a lot of the time when you read anti-imperialist literature, you're reading literature about um, uh, the, the, in, the United States imperialism. I think that's a big focus of, of, of anti-colonial and decolonial literature in a general sense. You're going to find a lot of anti-United States uh, 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 anti colonies of the United States. But I think that if you, you know, you read more broadly, you'll find things that are like anti French colo uh, colon uh, 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 colonialism and anti British. Uh, but uh, uh, Shusui is actually writing in the context of Japan. So he's talking about imperialism as it is rising in Japan and the con and, and how in what he was noticing about how it rose in the context of Japan. And a big part of that is the escalation of uh, uh, militarism in society. And uh, he has he has excellent uh, analysis of, of how militarism is associated with the imperial mindset or militarism within the uh, imperializing culture. Um, but it also just contains very good analysis of what imperialism is, um, how it arises in a general sense from the imperializing nation. Uh, and uh, I think I think it's a, it's an excellent resource for that reason. It's going to give a very different kind of angle on uh, how this all arises because you know he's he's talking about imperialism as not as how is at how it has arisen in either a capitalist culture or in a a, a culture you know, that was like one of the dominant world powers, you know, like take uh, the United States, France and Great Britain, for example, you know, these were imperial powers that were the like, almost like the world powers when they were empires, right? But Japan underwent imperialism when it was not a world power, right? It, it, it began attempting imperialism uh, uh, when it was like cons a considerable underdog in the in the global geopolitics. So I think that, you know, the insight about how imperialism even arose, it, it arose in this context is important in understanding imperialism broadly. Uh, the next one is Decolonizing Anarchism by Maya Romnath. 
And uh, this one's interesting because I went into it expecting it to be about just about decolonizing anarchism. But uh, a lot of what it's doing is uh, uh, offering the decolonial and imperialist uh, critique to anarchism and talking about uh, the way in which that has somewhat been uh, that it has not been uh, explored uh, uh, sufficiently by anarchists. And it does it a lot by talking about the context of India. So it talks a lot about uh, the way that uh, British imperialism functioned and how that interacted with uh, 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 radicalism in uh, India, but it also does something very interesting in, in that it uh, offers us a history of uh, Indian radicalism. And I suppose if I haven't already uh, clarified, I, I would I would hope it would be kind of obvious, but I'm talking about uh, India as in the country, not, you know, Native Americans. So uh, he or, or Maya Ramnath is, is talking about uh, 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 Indian anarchism, but also just sort of like Indian radical anti-authoritarianism and also talking about just like the context of like, uh, for example, how Gandhi fits into this whole picture. You know, is Gandhi an anarchist? And the text kind of gives us some very significant reasons to think otherwise. And I think what you'll find is that uh, Indian anarchist uh, history was very focused around like propaganda of the deed. And that's somewhat, a, uh, you know, a product of when it was rising, of course. But I think this was a big focus for them. And it really talks a lot about how propaganda of the deed was important in, to the Indian anarchists, uh, uh, the original Indian anarchists. And so also part of what it means when it calls itself decolonizing anarchism is that it's trying to uncover the sort of erased history of, of Indian anarchism and also offer a context for anarchism to the those who are living in India. So, uh, it, you know, it's got a lot to it. Uh, the last one on this list for decolonization, anti-imperialism, and anti-globalization is the video Land Back by Andrewism, or once again, St. Andrew, as you may know him. Uh, it's, it's just honestly a really great video introducing what Land Back is all about. And one of the aspects is that land back has a lot of possible meanings. It kind of depends on who you're talking to. Um, it, it, you know, obviously entails precisely what it says that land is returned to the indigenous populations, but like what is, what that means and like what that looks like is going to differ a lot. And I think Andrewism offers a really good overview of the, the, um, ideas that are contained within that, but also kind of giving us a liberatory vision for what that means. And, and, you know, um, if not like prescriptive, kind of gives us uh, a way to understand land back uh, that is that is, you know, compatible with an anti-authoritarian liberatory perspective, while also not erasing all of the other kinds of uh, 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 ideas that might be present within a discussion of what land back might mean. So I highly recommend it if you've heard land back and you don't really know what that means, especially if you're somebody out there right now that thinks that it's like some kind of like reactionary, uh, you know, racial separatism or something. You definitely should watch this <laughs> like this is this is for you to a significant degree. Um, so that concludes our list on decolonization, anti-imperialism and anti-globalization. Uh, as I've done in previous videos, I'm just going to continue on. I'm not going to stop there. We're going to start the next part of the list. And the next part of the list is social ecology. So uh, you may not be entirely familiar with what I mean by social ecology. I'll just preface by saying social ecology is a philosophical worldview, which is uh, predicated around the idea that ecological problems or environmental problems are caused by um, uh, hierarchical power structures or said much more simply that uh, uh, the domination of humanity over nature roots to the domination of humanity over one another. Uh, and that what we will have to repair the hierarchical power structures that exist within our society if we ever hope to solve ecological problems. So here are a bunch of pieces explaining uh, uh, 
th that, that particular concept, but also kind of explaining uh, ideas which are, are focused around the thoughts of Murray Bookchin. And so you might understand this is kind of like eco-anarchism. So uh, the first one on the list is kind of the most introductory of these, and that is Ecology and Revolutionary Thought by Murray Bookchin. Now, you might find it out there as by Lewis Herber, but that was a pen name that Murray Bookchin was using. Uh, ecology and Revolutionary Thought was uh, one of my introductions to the thoughts of Murray Bookchin, and I found it extremely helpful as an introduction. So what he's talking about in Ecology and Revolutionary Thought is basically that um, throughout history, certain areas of science have characterized uh, a revolutionary change in society as they were understood and as the implications of that science was understood. You know, he gives the example of like Copernicus and, you know, the shift into the, you know, uh, out of like theocracy and things like that. You know, he gives the example of, of Newton and how that changed our paradigm and how Einstein changed our paradigm and, you know, uh, Marx and sociology and political economy. And, you know, these, these are all just examples of different kinds of sciences really transforming the time that they were taking place in. You know, Darwin transforming the politics of the time in a way that's already been discussed on this list. And in fact, you know, with mutual aid. Um, and he's basically saying that that is the case in the modern era for the ecology or for ecology as a field. That in, or when we take into consideration the, the implications of ecology, that we will have uh, a transformative conception of how we have to approach our politics, how we have to approach revolutionary action, and that it will be revolutionary in us absorbing it into our understanding. And uh, that was a very significant piece for me. And I think it'll probably be the same for you if that is not familiar to you. Uh, the next one is Reason, Creativity, and Freedom by Eleanor Finley. Uh, this one was the introduction for a couple of people that I know into communalist or social ecologist thought. And that's because it's like this really concise piece. Uh, uh, Eleanor Finley really gives us this, this very nice rundown of the basics of uh, communalism and social ecology and the thought of Murray Bookchin and how that like relates to, to revolution. And, uh, you know, precisely as it's called, it's about these concepts of reason and creativity and freedom that are found within Murray Bookchin's work and uh, how that relates to our, not only the revolutionary struggle that we are experiencing, you know, uh, as, as people who are likely to read it, but across the world, you know, like um, how it relates to Rojava and the Zapatistas, for example, uh, who were all just mentioned recently. So I think that it, this one is, if you're looking for an introduction, you know, this might come right after eco ecology and revolutionary thought, or maybe even right before it. I think it's a great primer for the thought of Murray Bookchin. So uh, she did a wonderful job with this piece. Um, the next one is Toward an Ecological Society by Murray Bookchin. Uh, this one is actually a compilation of essays. And I would say this one is at kind of like an intermediate level. So some of these essays are somewhat challenging and dense, and some of these are going to be a pretty easy read. So they kind of like vary between their level of complexity and detail. But um, each of these are talking about what it looks like to form an ecological society, uh, precisely as it says. So they're going to involve a variety of topics. You know, uh, how do we view the ecology? Um, what does it look like to do urban planning? Uh, you know, what are some of the basics of the philosophy of social ecology and the principles that underlie, for example, liberatory technology, which you may have heard me talk about in another video. Uh, it, it's actually a very, it's a really good compilation of essays that I think if you read it in order, you are going to find it very enlightening. But uh, if you were to skip around, it would probably be very helpful to you as well. So uh, once again, I would say this one's kind of like at an intermediate level with some of these pieces being kind of dense and some of these pieces being pretty easy to understand. Uh, the last one on the list, it kind of just is, is, uh, uh, obligatory and that is Ecology of Freedom by Murray Bookchin. So the Ecology of Freedom is a masterwork. 
And uh, I've had numerous people who read it tell me that it was transformative for them. It contains a deep philosophical analysis. It contains uh, an extensive analysis of, uh, of you know, uh, early human history, the evolution and rise of hierarchy, where, where hierarchical power came from. Uh, it contains, you know, gender uh, analysis of patriarchy. It contains analysis of the state. It contains analysis of economic classes. Um, it is, it is extremely thorough. <laughs> uh, so I would say the early part of the book really focuses more on that. Then the mid part of the book starts to kind of switch it up, starts to go to a few different topics, including the rise of the merchant class. It talks about the relation of, uh, of uh, uh, ecology, uh, revolutionary thought, hierarchical mentalities, and Christianity, which might also interest you. And then I think the best part of the book is the end of the book, the last third of it. He is really laying out the principles of a liberatory ideology. If the very first part is, is like how hierarchy arose and then the middle part is kind of like, you know, how hierarchy festered into the modern form, uh, then the last part is laying out what it looks like to have a liberatory, a revolutionary conception of the world. So... Uh, appropriately. We have ended on the big book again, but I've gone over time. I really can't get into that habit. Otherwise I'll abuse it. Uh, so we'll just call that the end of the list. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that is it for this video. If you like the video, don't forget to go like. If you are interested in the channel of stuff like this, if these sorts of topics might interest you, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, please leave a comment below if you've got ideas for uh, later Anarch Abridged videos. Uh, also, the reading list, I just want to remind you, is in the description. So if you're just looking for this reading list, it's down there. But also, I should have links to all the other parts here. Uh, and the very last thing I would want to say is that be, my patrons are incredibly important to the perpetuation of this channel. Um, I, I am making much faster progress on my videos now that I have patrons uh, and, and now that, that, that my Patreon is growing. Uh, I am able to spend more and more time on the channel. That's part of the reason why I'm able to do these Anarch Abridged videos. Um, it, the, the script is coming along much more quickly because of it. You know, it makes an enormous difference in my life. I am right on this cusp right now between being able to completely devote all of my time to the channel while still being able to pay my bills uh, and still unfortunately having to work like these side gigs. So, you know, becoming a patron, right, especially right now, it would make an enormous difference in my life. So I would really appreciate it. If you like the material I'm creating here, go over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash anarch, become a patron. That's the spiel. I will talk to y'all next week.